Great, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Floyd from the Exertion Games Lab at RMIT in Melbourne, Australia. Um, but the, uh, the talk is mostly about uh, Sarah, Sarah Jane Hell, my colleague who uh, deeply apologizes that she can't be here, but she's already engaging in heavy preparations for her next adventure. So, uh, and this talk is entitled Technology Meets Adventure Learning from Earthquake Interrupted Mount Everest Expedition. Uh, Oh, that's very good point. Thank you. So this is going to be a rather, um, uh, probably a bit unusual Ubicom talk because it's essentially a story. So what I'm going to tell you is now a story. And uh, to fit with the unusualness of this talk, I thought I'd give you the take-home message beforehand. And that's the take-home message. I'm going to tell you a couple of tools to design for extreme adventure. And then you're going to argue that everyday exertion activities, such, such as jogging, elliptical trainer, um, any kind of sports activity, lie along a dimension. And if you then actually use these tools, you can apply them not only to extreme adventure, but also to everyday exertion activities. And that's important because it allows you to reframe them as mini adventures. And that's important because it allows you then to not just address any immediate short-term health benefits, but rather facilitate long-term, sorry, personal growth. And that's as the same as with extreme adventures. So that's the take-home message. And now uh, I start with the story. Uh, this is Sarah, and she, uh, as you might be able to tell from the picture, she calls herself an artist a researcher. Uh, she's an artist researcher and decided about three years ago that she wants to climb Mount Everest in order to make art on top of the mountain. She's not uh, a mountaineer, so therefore she bought herself a fitness tracker. Um, she uh, joined a fitness group. Um, she um, um, we tried out a lot of equipment in the lab in order to support her during that adventure. And then um, earlier last year, it was finally there, she started her multiple month and climb up Mount Everest. Um, she tried to document um, as much as she can of her experience and including her use of technology. So this is my little home for the next uh, 60 days or so. Um, we won't have Wi-Fi for a few more days. So the lack of Wi-Fi was not the biggest of her problems. Um, and there were uh, other challenges that uh, then arose. Um, it was minus 10 degrees at night in the tent, plus 40 during the day. It was very physically strenuous and demanding, but finally she arrived at um, Everest Base Camp, which is like the last station before the final ascent. Okay, looking over my shoulder, we can see Base Camp for the first time. Um, we've come past the Kumbu Glacier. Um, it's an absolutely stunning day here. Um, it's a little bit, bit exciting to see the place that we're going to call home. So you can see the yellow and orange tents dotted like a little city amongst the rocks and the ice. And it's kind of exciting. So, and then the unexpected happened. And her guide, who has climbed Mount Everest several times before, all of a sudden said that he felt there was something not right about the mountain. And he decided to abandon the expedition and descend. You know, of course, Sarah was very um, uh, upset and confused, and uh, she didn't know what to do. She had to go back down to the nearest town in order to uh, find a new guide and uh, get a new permit, because there's only a small amount of time during which in summer you can actually climb the mountain. And while she was in um, Thamel, the closest town, this is what happened. So, I just had a 7.9 earthquake on the Richter scale. We've had numerous aftershocks. There's buildings all around us that have um, come down and collapsed. We have no Wi Fi here. We've run down to the street to be able to send a message to loved ones to say that we're safe and alive, uh, but others are not so lucky. So, this was her perspective what happened. But um, uh, because shortly after uh, there was no more internet, there was no more TV, uh, so she only had a small view on how the uh, uh, events unfolded. Only a couple of days later, she learned through the newspaper, the paper of all media, uh, what, um, uh, what really happened, or what, to what extent the earthquake uh, was happening. It was the, uh, one of the worst uh, natural disasters in recent times, 
Um, it killed over 8,000 people, two and a half million were dislocated, um, and she also learned that um, it triggered an avalanche on base camp, which, came in, which killed 22 people of some of the people she just recently met a couple of days ago. This was then followed by seven days of uh, hiking to the nearest embassy without any shelter, without any sanitation, in order to then be uh, evacuated with all the other um, foreigners. So, you could maybe agree with me that she certainly had an adventure with that. And we were then thinking, is there anything that we can learn from when this technology meets adventure? And in order to answer that, we first of all need to define adventure. And we said adventure is an exciting experience involving hazardous action with uncertain outcomes based around physical exertion in a natural environment. And in terms of um, the mentioning of adventure in HCI, there's actually a history. So Greenberg talks about how he escaped an avalanche. I wanted to say something about the design of mobile devices. And Edwin Hutchins, in his um, popular book, Cognition in the Wild, learned actually from his experience of open ocean um, sailboat racing in order to say something about how people work together in teams. But you might say, Floyd, do we really need technology during adventure? Um, and I think we still have this, um, um, this romantic notion that if you engage in adventure, you don't, and you're not involving any technology at all. But if you think about it, um, in fact, adventures have been using technology for a long time. And certainly Sarah has used some of this traditional adventure. But what we notice now more and more, if you look at adventure shops, there's more and more digital interactive technology emerging that is available for adventurers. And this is Sarah's um, gear that she took with her. And of course, because she's a lab, she had more gear with her. But it was very similar to what other adventurers took with them um, these days. This is the, uh, the charging tent that uh, her friends established just to charge all these devices with the limited solar power. And Sarah also points out that these adventures need to be funded, right? And she did what a lot of other adventurers do. She started a Kickstarter campaign in order to get money to fund her adventure. And then she said she had this um, strange, um, and because her backers, um, Sorry, so she, she got the Kickstarter in order to have backers, right? But she had this strange social pressure of providing um, social media updates to her backers because she said that's what they expected in order to provide them with money. So she felt this pressure to always have a mobile phone charged and to post things. So um, in some what I want to say here is that technology certainly has met adventures. We try to understand what does this all mean. And for that, we looked at the following method. We could have interviewed a whole bunch of adventurers, but we chose rather to let Sarah reflect on her own adventure through autoethnography, because we believe bodily experiences are best understood by going through them oneself. And this is what we found. Well, we can articulate a two-dimensional design space in which there are instrumental aspects and experiential aspects. And technology supports you in different ways during adventure. In terms of instrumental aspects, the best example is probably the Garmin GPS, that allowed Sarah to find her way up the mountain. In terms of the experiential aspect, um, the probably best example for that is her 360-degree camera that allowed her to do these amazing panorama shots that didn't really help her get up the mountain, but certainly helped her in storytelling afterwards about it. But perpendicular to this axis is another dimension that ranges from the expected to the unexpected. Because in every adventure, there's expected things and unexpected things. And certainly her guide feeling something about the mountain not being right and then the earthquake was one of these unexpected things. And I'll show you a piece of technology that supported her in both. And that is our Nexus. It's a biosensing device that she expected to use in order to track her bio data. And she expected it and she did that in the expected way. But she never expected to use it on somebody else. But she met a new friend and that became a friend, a new person that became a friend, who uh, was suspected to have altitude sickness. So she used her device to measure her oxygen levels in the blood and then determined that it was way, way lower um, than they anticipated. So they organized like a rescue emergency um, crew to help her down the mountain. That was an unexpected use of technology. 
So with this two-dimensional design space, I argue now that there are four roles of, this, of design that technology can play for adventurers. And these are a coach, a rescuer, a documentarian, and a mentor. Let's look at the coach first. A typical example of technology that um, took on the role of a coach was her jawbone that she bought, the a fitness tracker that she talk, uh, bought from the very first day. Um, it functions in a coach as it teaches you to know when you've done approximately 10,000 steps during the day, and once you have that skill, you don't need that coach anymore, and therefore you abandon the device. A typical example for a rescuer uh, role is a personal locator beacon. Um, I have one of these. They used to cost about $3,000, now they cost um, $300. And it's a really funny device because you hope you never need to use it. Uh, because it's got one button, if you're at Strive, you press that one button and then via satellites it calls emergency services. Documentarian. Typical example for the documentarian role was her chest-mounted GoPro camera. Because it allowed her to have like, really unique perspectives on her adventure. And for the last, the mentor. A mentor is different than a coach, right? A mentor helps the adventurer to understand what it all means for the life of the adventurer. And we couldn't really quite identify any technology that helped her in that regard, in particular to deal with a trauma post-earthquake. So we believe there's a particular opportunity here. But in some, these four roles of design hopefully give you some guidance to design for adventure. But you now might say, but Floyd, I don't design for super fit adventure type users. Maybe you have like, um, you potential user groups like this, where you go, I've got this grant and I want to support this person going jogging or doing any other kind of physical activity. And we argue that our two-dimensional design space might also be useful here, because even with jogging, there's an instrumental experiential aspect. You're not just going from A to B, otherwise you can just take the bus. And there's a lot of expected and unexpected, because it might start raining, or you might strain your ankle. So there's a lot of similarities, but there's also differences. Because I think we also need to ask why people engage in jogging. And I think we still have often this, um, uh, this kind of wrong notion that all it takes is a doctor who tells you, ah, you should go jogging in order to fix some immediate small-term health issue and then you become a lifelong jogger. Because that's certainly not why adventurers engage in adventure. No doctor tells these guys to climb Mount Everest. But I think it's important to ask why they do that. Why do they climb Mount Everest? And you might know this, um, this quote by Mallory almost 100 years ago, now because he said, um, because it's there. So there seems to be actually no point in climbing Mount Everest. But I'm arguing here is that because there is no point, that is the reason why it's so valuable. And because it's so valuable, it shows that you're doing physical activity for its own sake. And if you do that, then it can help facilitate personal growth. So what I've shown uh, with this diagram earlier is if you follow these four, um, four roles of design, then you can facilitate personal growth. And that is so important because if we look at extreme adventure on one end of a spectrum and everyday exertion activities or any physical activity on the other, we can now apply these four roles of, you know, of design and also apply them to everyday exertion activities, which allow us to reframe them as everyday mini adventures. And that is so important because it allows us to go from short term immediate health issue addressing to facilitating pers long term personal growth, as in extreme adventures. And that is basically my call for action today. I think we should think more about designing technology for personal growth. And for that, I've given you like a two dimensional design space along with four roles, technology design can play that. And um, Sarah and I say thank you for our talk, Technology Needs Adventure, Learnings from an Earthquake Interrupted Mount Everest Expedition. Thank you very much.